Italy, a magnificent country. It's all here. It's quite breathtaking. A place where I feel deeply connected. This is where my grandmother Polizzi's journey began. In this series, I'm returning, but I'm leaving the mainland to explore Italy's extraordinary islands. So beautiful. Revisiting memories. I haven't been here since I was a child, and I thought I'd make a pilgrimage. And building new ones. I mean, this is one of the maddest things I've ever done. Oh! <laughs> Feels like a once-in-a-lifetime experience. On a journey of discovery, from the ancient, rugged beauty of Sardinia, the remains here are spine-tingling, to the splendor and surprises of Sicily. And some of the Mediterranean's hidden treasures it does just feel a million miles away from anywhere else. <laughs> Look at this. It's one of Sicily's most striking secrets. I can't believe it, it's been too long. This is my Italian island adventure. My island escapade has brought me to Sicily the largest island in the Mediterranean, mystical and ancient, Sicily is a crossroads of cultures where the East meets the West. When I was a student, I rented a car and traveled the island with a friend. It was a magical journey. This time, I'm traveling across the North, from the bustling and bewitching city of Palermo, inland to the little-known Gangi, recently crowned the prettiest village in Italy, ending up on the east coast and the ancient and beautiful city of Syracuse. But I'm starting in the island's enigmatic capital, Palermo. I absolutely love Palermo. There's a lot of urban sprawl, but there's so much beauty. It's the fifth most populated city in Italy. Around 1.2 million people call this hot and humid city home. With an international airport, Palermo is easily accessible from anywhere in the world. But when you reach its city centre, its hive of chaotic streets and dishevelled buildings can seem intimidating to even the most hardy traveller. It's slightly scary city if you've never been here before, but it repays bounteously all your patience and investment because there's so much to discover. It's one of the great cities of Europe and any opportunity to come here is a good one. A melting pot of history and culture, Palermo is like a beautiful dame in decay. It may not have the splendor of Florence or the romance of Rome, but Palermo has so much to offer, like the iconic Teatro Massimo. This colossal theater is the largest in Italy and the third largest in Europe. But it's when you head into its honeycomb of side streets that you find the real surprises. And perhaps the most beguiling is Palazzo Gangi. From the outside, you would have no idea of what lies behind this unassuming door. Yet inside is the most sumptuous private residence in Sicily. Or maybe the whole of Europe. A masterpiece of the Baroque style, the palazzo was constructed in the 18th century by the Prince and Princess of Ganji. It's still owned by the same family today. On appointment, the current owner, Princess Karin, opens her doors to the public. But today, I'm lucky to have been granted my own private view. Well, this is what I call a ballroom. People come to Palermo just to come to Palazzo Gangi, and looking at this, you can really understand why. It transports you back to a 
completely different world. It's very seductive. What's astonishing is the family have spent 20 years restoring this place with no state aid. It is a labor of love, and that is evident everywhere you turn. Good Lord. <laughs> Look at this. It's not often that a room can leave me breathless, <laughs> but... This room... Apparently, it was designed as a forest of gold. Look at that chandelier. It's got 102 arms. Imagine trying to clean it. I had heard that this was one of the treasures of Sicily, but you know what? I don't think I was quite expecting this. I've never seen a room like it. This is Versailles on a domestic scale. I want a party. <laughs> I do, I want to, oh, what can I say? Except I've got room envy. The history of this city is not just evident in its precious palazzos and grand crumbling churches. As a city that has survived centuries of raids, invasions and conquests, it can also be found in the food that's sold on its streets. Salvatore is a street food connoisseur. Why is street food so important to Palermo? The main and the first reason was that the best way to feed the most poor part of the population. Actually, uh, Palermo is uh, the first city in Europe for street food. No. And uh, the number five in the world. Salvatore likens Palermo to the layers of a lasagna, each one a different foreign influence. The Arabs ruled Sicily for centuries, and they have left a lasting culinary legacy here in Palermo. This is one of the most important places for street food in Palermo. Here you can find like the best uh, chickpeas fried of the city. Salvatore has brought me to Franco Uvastidaro, a bar that sells chickpea fritters, a cheap and hugely popular snack in this city. This is an easy way into street food. Just a few seconds in the oil. Lovely, thank you so much. The lemon is really important. You will see it's always the last step in our street food culture because it's gonna disinfect the food just before you're gonna eat. This is made with just chickpea flour. And salt. The key of like street food it's, uh, in Palermo is a few ingredients. Simplicity. Simplicity. Another Arabic speciality that you'll see the locals feasting on is arancini, giant fried rice balls. Arancini means little oranges in Sicilian, and these hefty globes can be found all over Palermo. But Salvatore says the best ones are here at bar touring in the city centre. Okay, so what are the rules about making arancini? You're gonna put the meat in the centre, like the heart of the dish. Then you're gonna cover the meat with the rice and then you fry it for a few seconds uh, in the oil. But uh, in this bar, the best way that they found is use a lard to fry it. And you will see, it's so delicious. Because uh, <laughs> fry it in lard. This is not going to be a dietetic meal. I can tell. No, totally not, no, actually. No. Thank, Thank you. you. Buon appetito. Grazie. Grazie. So, the meat in the center, then the rice, and then the shell. It's lovely. The arancini here weigh close to half a kilo. My goodness, eat one of these, and I don't think you'd be moving very far, very fast the rest of the day. <laughs> the 
final stop on our gastronomic tour of Palermo is not for the faint-hearted. This is not your typical Italian food. Here we are talking about Splint Sandwich, which is like the king of our street food. At some point, a lot of Jewish came here in Sicily. They not only created the street food, but they also create the way to cook the street food in the street. Recently, this sandwich won uh, the title of the best street food sapo, sapo. of Italy, and the chef, Nino, when he prepares a sandwich, he will dance. Nino is legendary here in Palermo. His bar is the place to eat spin sandwich, but to eat it, you need a strong stomach. What because goes in there? Inside, we have uh, three different organs. Lang, tang, and spleen. And it's lung, tongue, and spleen because they're cheap parts of a cow. Exactly. So, this is Palermo in a bite. <laughs> we left you with our words. <laughs> <laughs> Tastes delicious. I think I agree with Salvatore. It is Palermo in a bun. Unusual, edgy, but well worth the risk. And I'm about to take another as I discover Palermo's dark side. It's impossible to take a historical tour of Palermo and do it justice without exploring its dark and sinister side. For Sicily is the motherland of the Mafia, and the spectre of La Cosa Nostra has long since haunted the streets of this city. But as the Mafia's grip on Sicily loosens, you can feel Palermo emerging from the shadows of its ugly past. This shift can be traced back to one brave man, the anti-mafia judge Giovanni Falcone. He lost his life fighting the scourge of the mafia. As you drive through the north of the city, you may come across a strange makeshift shrine to Falcone. In front of the house where he lived is a tree of devotion, where the people of Palermo pay their personal respects to this most beloved son of the city. When Falcone died in 1992, there were shockwaves around the world. It had been quite easy to think of the Mafia until then as something that existed in The Godfather, and they were made slightly glamorous. But this, in fact, was the reality, that someone who was fighting so hard to bring kind of honor back into the judicial system here was brutally murdered. I think we all felt that there was an innocence that died that day and that we had to face the reality that was modern Italy. Messages of solidarity and remembrance hang from the Falcone tree. It's a touching memorial. I was 22 when Falcone died, and in my family we talked about him a lot and about what he was trying to do with Italy. And it was a source of honor that he was so brave and so determined, so fearless. There's never enough people like that in the world. There were a lot of tears when he died. I think it was a moment of real shock for Italy and for Italians all over the world. The assassination was retaliation for the mobsters Falcone had put behind bars. Most visitors traveling into Palermo will drive the fateful journey that Falcone took that day. He was killed in Capaci on a stretch of the motorway between the airport and the city. He was traveling with his wife and three bodyguards when his Fiat Croma was obliterated by a huge bomb placed beneath the road. A mafia hitman detonated the bomb as the car drove over it. The explosion made a crater 30 feet in diameter. That's where the, the 
mafia also who blew up that stretch of road was hiding, waiting and watching for Falcone's car. And they had meticulously planned this whole operation and it was done to show the might of the mafia. These pillars designate the exact spot where it happened. It was such a big explosion. It was amazing that it didn't decimate more people. The killing didn't stop with Falcone. Paolo Borsellino, his closest collaborator and dearest friend, was also brutally murdered. These shocking events left an indelible mark on the people of the city. The nice thing is that Falcone and Borsellino are remembered daily in the lives of Palermitani because they are hero worshipped by generations. But alongside its more sobering sights, the city today is proud to show its visitors how the tide is turning against organized crime. From their office in Palermo, a group of idealistic young Sicilians run a grassroots movement called Adio Pizzo. Pizzo is a Sicilian slang for the protection money that the mafia managed to extort from about 80% of small businesses in Palermo. This group's bold idea is to cut off that supply, which reportedly provides mafia in southern Italy an estimated 20 billion euros a year. In a quiet park in the city, I'm meeting Eduardo, a co-founder of the organization. Eduardo, Hi. salve. Hi, nice to meet you. Sono Alex. For his guided tour of some of the businesses who have bravely stood up and said no to the mafia. Adio Pizzo was born uh, in 2004, so it's more than 10 years ago now. And it was born uh, because of uh, a group of young people who had uh, a fantastic idea to uh, print uh, some stickers with uh, an anti-mafia slogan yes. and to pepper the town basically by night in order to push the people to be aware of uh, one of the main problems of Palermo. It's the protection money, so it's the system of uh, extortion run by the mafia. When uh, the Mafia killed uh, the prosecutors, Falcone Conan, and Barcelona, yes, with, uh, with the bombs, um, I was uh, a teenager. Uh, our generation uh, was, like, was shocked by what happened. So somehow this uh, event uh, really was a turning point for our generation in particular. And as soon uh, as someone had the idea of the stickers, someone had the idea of uh, uh, doing something for this town, Oh, we, we, we were there. We felt that uh, it was our turn to do something. But it was when the campaign reached out to consumers that it really gained momentum. Basically, it works like, uh, you know, those uh, uh, signs, uh, beware to the dog, you know? So it's like, uh, pay attention, if you dare to get in, inside and try to get the money from us, so we will report you to the police immediately. So basically, the Mafia stay away from the shops that has this sign on it. It's a declaration, it's a statement. Here, we don't pay protection money, we don't pay pizzas, we are not contributing to the Mafia. So they know that when they come here, they're definitely not a penny of what's going towards exactly. them is going to the yes. Mafia. It's exactly. very clever. Thank you. Today, you can eat, shop and sleep in over a thousand establishments that have signed up to the anti-extortion charter. We had proof that the Mafia is scared of, uh, of the people who have the courage to stay together and rebel. Yes, some Mafiosi, after being arrested actually, uh, confessed that the, that the Mafia want to stay away from the Adio Pizzo shop. Ah, yes, yes. very say, good. That's a good sign, Oh, yes, it? yes. They were like a sort of testimonial. Luckily for me, my fascination with this courageous movement has brought my tour of Palermo around to one of my favourite subjects, fashion. Because one of the first companies to commit to the ideal pizza movement happens to be a cooperative of ladies who lovingly stitch together a legendary Sicilian hat. The coppola goes back to peasant times 
But in the 1930s, this humble hat was claimed by mafiosi, who wore it twisted to the side. From its headquarters in the hills just outside Palermo, La Coppola Storta is striving to repair its damaged reputation and reinvent the Coppola for a new generation. The driving force of their ambition is head stylist Tindara. Her shop in the center of Palermo is full of Coppolas of all styles, fabrics and colors. Tindara. Sono Alex, Polizia, salve. Come stai? Bene. È visto il nostro mondo, il mondo della coppola. I know, it's amazing. La coppola è un copricapo simbolo del costume siciliano da tanti anni. Ha una storia molto antica che purtroppo nel tempo è caduta ed è diventata uno stereotipo di una cultura deteriore che non appartiene alla Sicilia. All'estero spesso è vista come un simbolo di mafia, era vista, mi piace dire. E come noi diciamo sempre, se la porta Filippo di Edimburgo è un gran signore, se la porta un siciliano è un mafioso. Questo noi abbiamo voluto cambiare veramente. So I have to laugh because you know the coppola, the shape of this hat came from Great Britain. She's very proud of the fact that although this was stereotypically a man's hat and it denoted a certain kind of person, now they produce almost as many hats for women as they do for men and it has become a fashion item. Voglio provare qualche cappello, posso? Posso provare subito. I want to try some. <laughs> Mm. Oh god, that's really fun. I love this fabric. È bello colorato. Gone are the serious and muted shades of the coppola. Now designs of every color and pattern emblazon these hats. Rosso è carino. Sì. I like it. For around 50 euros, it's possible to take home a hand-stitched piece of Sicilian history. E poi me lo dai. Thank you. Una è sempre elegante. Oh, this. This is definitely the one for me. Proprio questo mi sembra il tuo stile. Il mio stile. Assolutamente. Perfect. I've been really inspired by what I found out about Palermo this afternoon and the people who are trying so hard to change the stereotypes that have bedeviled this island for so long. Sicily is no longer that land of the mafia myth. There is a lot more to it than that. As I'm about to discover as I head inland to the remote and wild Sicilian interior. lights of Palermo to the mountainous Sicilian interior and the gorgeous town of Ganji. Only a few hours drive from the capital, this remote region is breathtakingly beautiful. You'll see wide open vistas of bountiful fields, dramatic rocky outcrops and picturesque villages like this one that cling impossibly to the hillsides. When people come to Sicily, they tend to stick to the coast. And it's a great shame that um, these parts are as yet relatively undiscovered. They really repay a little bit of time and energy because they're so unspoiled. It's absolutely stunning. There are any number of beautiful villages nestled here in the mountains, but there's one place I had to see. As you approach it, the hilltop town of Ganji literally cascades down the hillside. It's a sight to behold. But this town is more than meets the eye. Here, one innovative mayor has orchestrated the complete transformation of Ganji's fortunes. Signor Sindaco, sono Alex Polizzi, piacere. Giuseppe Ferrarello, benvenuto. Grazie, sono molto felice di essere qui. 
anche noi di ospitarli. E di vedere questi tetti incredibili di Ganji. Today, Ganji is on the tourist trail, but that's not always been the case. When he first arrived as mayor, people had left and abandoned their historic homes and were moving down the hill. So he decided to restore the center to as it was before and slowly but surely recreating the atmosphere that it once was here and making it a kind of perfect jewel. In the eight years he has been in office, Mayor Ferrarello and his team have worked tirelessly to repopulate the historic center. New museums, art galleries, and a busy calendar of festivals among many initiatives to bring the town back to life. Of all Mayor Ferrarello's plans, the most impressive is also the most radical. Praticamente noi, avendo il problema di molte case nel centro storico abbandonate, abbiamo avuto questa idea pazza. Prima ci prendevano per folli, praticamente. <laughs> Not surprising. On paper, his scheme sounds like complete madness. They realized that they had 500 empty houses. So he sent out the word that there were houses to be had here for nothing. The only catch is that the new owner has to sign an agreement to spend around 35,000 euros refurbishing it within five years. So far, they have 50 houses that have been rebuilt and 2,000 requests for houses currently on the books. He doesn't want people just to buy them as an investment. He wants this to be a living village. And so it's very important to him that people have some kind of connection with the place, that they're going to keep coming back and that they feel, fall as in love with Ganji as he is. And many have. Over a hundred people from around the world have bought into the scheme, lured by the charm and relaxed rhythms of Ganji. And I think the mayor may be trying to lure another. There's one property he seems very keen to show me. Ah, c'è un po' di lavoro a fare. C'è un po' di lavoro a fare, ma ne vale sicuramente sicuramente la pena, no? Absolutely lovely, isn't it? It's got enormous charm and obviously huge possibilities. Posso immaginarmi in questa casa qui, casa polizia? Sì, sì, ti puoi immaginare, te la regaliamo con grande piacere. This novel approach to revival has allowed the local economy to flourish, providing employment and energizing tourism here. It's a truly remarkable turnaround. Immagino, andiamo diretti. Questo è uno dei nuovi. Sì. Si vede la differenza. E questo è il lavoro di cui parlavo. Questo è il lavoro di cui parlavo, che è stata ristrutturata, tolto il cemento, fatta a pietra. Questo è il muro com'era? Sì, brava, sì. E questo è come è rifatto. Non c'è dubbio, assolutamente. This is literally the before and after in front of our eyes. The house before it was restructured with this horrible cement. And the house after it, where you have all the stone exposed as it once was, rather more beautiful. Isn't it? Perché hanno fatto questo lavoro? Perché negli anni 70, 80... Eh sì, avevano un gusto pessimo. Un gusto pessimo, sì. Barbari, penso. Barbaro. So, tutto questo ha avuto che risultato? Ha avuto risultati eh, enormi, il maggiore naturalmente è che oramai viene tanta gente a trovarci, ma abbiamo ricevuto tantissimi riconoscimenti a livello nazionale e internazionale. Nel 2014 siamo diventato il borgo più bello tra i borghi più belli d'Italia. Tutta una serie di... I mean, this is a very energetic man. What can I tell you? He has not let the grass grow under his feet. The list of what he's managed to achieve in eight years is phenomenal. And frankly, I feel very lazy compared to him. There's one final accomplishment of this inspirational mayor that I simply have to see before leaving Ganji. <laughs> He has reopened the crypt of the town's main church to the public. But this isn't any old crypt. So this is the crypt.
crypt of the mummified monks. There's about 100 monks in here. I mean, these are real skeletons. This is the only place outside ancient Egypt, I believe, that had this habit of mummifying people. It's very, very odd. The bond between the living and the dead is particularly strong here in Sicily. Mummification rites were practiced on the island until the late 19th century. The aim was to keep them looking more or less alive for as long as possible. The technique, apparently, was exactly that that was used in Egypt. Organs taken out, embalmed, wrapped in bandages. The head was taken off, separated from the body, and put on a spike. And then a kind of wax was put over the skin of the face. Gosh. He's fairly well preserved, relatively speaking. These desiccated dead provide scientists with a fresh insight into life and death in Sicily from the late 1600s. It's actually an incredible resource because it allows us to find out what kind of illnesses existed then and what genetic traits were. Framed information gives some clue to the stories of these mysterious monks. This is one from 1870. The mummification of corpses was seen as a way to preserve status and dignity even in death. Although looking at the creepy cadavers on display today, I'm not sure how dignified it is. I suppose it's something that's so unusual that one has to view it dispassionately. Just their attitudes, their attitudes in death are deeply, deeply disturbing. None of us like to face death, but I think I prefer the idea of someone being safely put in the ground. The most weird thing I've ever seen. Disturbing it may be, but this crypt is morbidly fascinating too. It's an example of the rich tapestry of history and culture on offer here in northern Sicily. And more treasures await on the east coast. Travelling across the north of this island, it's impossible not to feel the depth of its history. It's all around you. But there's one iconic piece of Sicily's past that's missing from its vast landscape. I've come to a farm with a difference in the foothills of Mount Etna to meet a vet called Ketty, who is doing her bit to keep an island treasure alive. This is Azalat, a sanctuary for the Sicilian donkey. The introduction of engines made the donkey redundant here in Sicily. They're now endangered but Ketty has given the Sicilian donkey a second chance. Where they once told the land, they now produce milk for lactose intolerant children. Come mai hai tutti questi asini qui? Come è successo? Tanti anni fa, quando ho avuto il mio primo figlio, ho scoperto il mondo delle intolleranze al latte vaccino di come l'asino può essere una soluzione. L'asina produce il latte più simile al latte umano e quindi il bambino la riconosce come il latte materno e anche se è allergico alle formule maternizzate che ci sono in farmacia può bere il latte di asino. Amazing. They're very, very friendly animals. Sono, sono proprio affettuosi. Questo dipende dalla loro storia. Ah, sì. E l'asino eh, praticamente viveva in casa con gli uomini, quindi il suo legame è, è forte. Poi è un animale estremamente buono e sensibile, quindi si affeziona in maniera... Come un cane, possiamo dire. And somehow in our minds, the idea of the horse and the donkey and the mule have all become conflated. The horse is at the top of the pile and the mule, the donkey, are the, at the bottom. But in fact, they're completely different animals. 
lo, il cavallo, vive lo stallone al centro del gruppo femminile, lo conduce, lo difende e, quindi, e invece il gruppo eh, delle asine è un gruppo solo femminile, matriarcale. La matriarca rimane il capo. So the more I find out about donkeys, the more I like them. The males are kept at the margins of their society as being extremely unimportant. Can't imagine why. Queste felicità. Chiamano, chiamano. Or perhaps they're telling us that it's 11 o'clock, which means it's milking time. I've never seen a donkey milk before. I'm looking forward to this. Apparently it only takes a minute per donkey. There's about half a litre per donkey and they're milked twice a day. It's going to be interesting. Donkey milk has the same protein percentage as human milk, 1.9%. It also has the same kind of sugars and zero cholesterol. Ketty's farm produces 40 litres of milk a day, which she sells at 14 euros a litre. I've fallen in love with these animals. You could too. Ketty's farm is open to the public. And if you do come, it would be rude not to sample their precious milk. My first ever donkey milk. <laughs> Salute. Salute. Chin chin. Ci saranno vari livelli di chin chin. È come un latte mm, scremato, you know. Sì, è meno dell'1% di grassi. Less than 1% fat. I was slightly dreading trying donkey milk. I don't know why, like I haven't tried lots of other things. But actually, it's quite sweet and it's very light. It doesn't feel so fatty. I'm not a huge fan of cow's milk to start with. This is much more on my street. Lo senti un po' questa essenza vegetale, un po' no? Troppo? <laughs> Ti chiedo troppo? Sommelier del latte. <laughs> She's like a kind of donkey sommelier. She said, <laughs> Katie said to me, can I, can I taste the odor of the plants coming through? And I kind of rather not think too hard about that. No, I think is the answer. <laughs> Fantastico, grazie. Grazie a te. You know, passion like Ketty's is always inspiring. It's amazing what she's doing with this donkey. These are a big part of Sicilian history, so it's wonderful that she's kind of keeping the tradition alive. In their heyday, these donkeys would have been tethered to another integral and unique piece of Sicilian history. The Caretto Siciliano is a beautifully carved and exquisitely decorated horse-drawn cart. But, like the donkey, the Sicilian cart is an island tradition close to extinction. Just down the road from Ketty, in the town of Trecastagni, Father Alfio and San Giuseppe are doing their bit to keep the Sicilian folklore alive. You'll see these colourful carts brightening up festivals across the island. This is a real beauty pageant. I mean, it's bloody impressive. Today, they're giving me an exclusive glimpse of the whole pomp and ceremony. It's quite a fanfare. But I certainly wasn't expecting to be accompanied by all the bells and whistles of a band. Nothing quite represents Sicily like these travelling works of art. Giuseppe's vibrant and flamboyant carts have even featured in adverts for Dolce & Gabbana. I mean, this is one of the maddest things I've ever done. I don't even really like horses very much, and being at the business end of a horse isn't, my, isn't what I would normally look forward to. But you can imagine the effect that a cart like this would have had. It must have blown people's minds. In use since the early 1800s, the Caretto Siciliano reached their peak of popularity in the 1920s, when many thousands brightened the streets of the island. The carts were a wandering picture book that depicted historical, literary, religious or chivalrous events. It's layer upon layer of decoration, so it's both functional, such as these which help support the cart and make it stronger and decorative. 
what I love about it is in those rather drab and hard working times that there was such pleasure and such colour, it must have brought so much glamour and joy into people's lives. I think it's gorgeous. I want one. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm not sure the streets of London are ready for this. They're quintessentially Sicilian. Thank God for families like this one for preserving them. My journey across the north of Sicily has reached the east coast and my final destination, Syracuse. Syracuse is a window to the ancient history of the Mediterranean. Ruins of temples and Baroque statues grace this special city. But a strange, modern, cone-shaped building dominates the skyline here. It has to be seen to be believed. This is the Sanctuary of Our Lady of Tears, a church built in honour of a miracle that happened here 62 years ago. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you too. Welcome to the sanctuary. So tell me the story of what happened. Yes, the story of the Virgin Mary of Syracuse began on the 29th of August of 1953 in a local house of Syracuse. It was the house of a, a young married couple Antonina and Angelo Iannuso. And uh, it's believed a small image of the Virgin Mary cried, shed human tears for four days. It was very extraordinary. In 1953, people flocked from around the world to witness the tears of the Madonna. They still make pilgrimages here today, and I'm making my own. <sighs> this is the inside. And it's astonishing. You have no idea from outside that the interior is going to be like this, and it's stunning. There's the Madonna that was originally hanging over the bed that cried the real tears, and she's incredibly beautiful. It's a peaceful and fitting end to my travels across the north of this vast island. This journey across the north of Sicily has been so rewarding because every time I come back, I find something new. There's so many layers to the society, to the architecture, to the culture here. There's so much history. We never get to the bottom of it. It makes my soul sing. Next time, I venture south to explore Sicily's wilder regions. These are the Turkish steppes, aren't they? Amazing. From the Baroque beauty of its stunning towns to the striking coast. <laughs>